are Doctor Who fans. For faithful viewers of a show all about time travel and endless possibilities, their understanding can very often be linear and unimaginative. Which is why there is always a clamour of angry tweets or message board posts each time a new bit of lore or storytelling appears to make no sense. The answers are sometimes simple bad writing. The fact that for the first 20 years no one was expected to watch all of Doctor Who in order and subsequently find troubling contradictions. The rest of the time it's usually due to Stephen Moffat vastly overestimating the intelligence of his audience. So allow this list to pick over the questions that have been confusing you for years in an attempt to either answer them once and for all or make them even more confusing. With that in mind, I'm Ellie with Who Culture, and this is 10 Doctor Who questions that always confused you. Number 10. What is the Doctor's name? The oldest question, hidden in plain sight. Stephen Moffat teased us with this throughout Matt Smith's years before revealing that it's not important. What's important is the title they chose and how it reflects their actions. Because what name would even be satisfying for fans? Keith? The question of the Doctor's birth name is something that becomes more complex the more you think about it. Gallifrey is the planet where Romanad Veratralunda is a perfectly normal thing to call a child for goodness sake. We know that the Doctor was nicknamed Theta Sigma in college and only reveal their name to those they're intimate with. And that's about it. Things have got even more complex now that we no longer have a clue where the Doctor is from. A lost child abandoned in our universe, adopted by Tech Tayun. What was that child's name? And come to think of it, what was their name after they were regenerated into a child on leaving Division? Doctor Who has never seemed like a more appropriate title for the show. Probably best we don't dwell on it and just carry on calling them the Doctor. Number 9. Where does Joe Martin fit into the lineup? When Ruth was first introduced to be an unknown incarnation of the Doctor, various speculative theories were churned out by fan sites. Were they between Patrick Troughton and John Pertwee in a fresh spin on the long-held belief in the Season 6B theory? This theory posits that the second Doctor was a Time Lord agent spawned from the fact that an older Patrick Troughton didn't dye his hair black when he returned to the role. Whilst their story is confusingly related through the prism of a cosy Sunday night TV show about an Irish policeman, the Timeless Children makes it clear that Ruth is pre-Hartnell. Their memories were wiped and they eventually became the first Doctor we all know which still confuses and outrages some corners of the fandom. The more militant fans believe that the very idea of Doctors existing prior to the first Doctor is tantamount to heresy. Doctor Who fans are boringly linear. Hartnell will always be the first Doctor that we as an audience encounter. The fact that the character has a whole mysterious life beforehand doesn't desecrate Hartnell's legacy. It ensures its longevity as the show approaches its sixth decade. Number 8. Wait, why can't he go back and save Amy and Rory? The ending of The Angels Take Manhattan, in which the Doctor states that he cannot return to New York to save Amy and Rory, led to a lot of confusion and couldn't they just meet up in another city on social media? So much so that Stephen Moffat wrote a lengthy response in Doctor Who magazine. There is so much scar tissue and the number of paradoxes that have already been inflicted on that nexus of timelines that it will rip apart if you try to do one more thing. He has to leave it alone. There's also a more simple emotional explanation too. The whole of Series 7A is about Amy and Rory trying to balance normal married life with adventures in time and space, increasingly aware that one day they'll have to stop travelling in the TARDIS. That decision is eventually taken out of their hands when a weeping angel zaps Rory back in time and Amy decides to willingly sacrifice herself to be reunited with her husband. The Doctor can't go back because he knows that Amy doesn't want him to. She wants a life with Rory. It's the perfect ending. Sadly, Doctor Who fans are so focused on the intricacies of time paradoxes that they often miss out on the simple things like human emotion. Number 7. What is the Valiard? In the final stages of the Trial of a Time Lord, it is revealed that the Doctor's prosecutor, the Valiard, is actually an evil version of the Doctor himself, a distillation of the Doctor's darker impulses from somewhere between the Doctor's 12th and 13th lives. 
But what does that actually mean? The master's description of the Valiard is more of a metaphorical concept, so how did it gain a physical form? No answers are forthcoming in the trial's notoriously troubled final two episode which descends into a chase across the Matrix. A chase all the writers Pip and Jane Baker running away full pelt from trying to explain the concept teed up by Valiard creator Robert Holmes. Fans have tried to answer this question through spin-off novels, short stories and audio adventures, yet these muddy the waters even more. One story states that he's a villainous version of the Doctor plucked from the multiverse. One audio suggests the Valiard was a byproduct of an experiment by the Doctor to break the 12 regeneration limit. Awkwardly, this was released just a week before the 11th Doctor was granted a new regeneration cycle. All of this confusion could have been avoided if it had just turned out that the Valiard was the master in disguise. After all, aren't they really the Dark Doctor? Number 6. Has Davros had his eyes closed the whole time? Who'd have thought that a pair of eyes would be the most controversial moment in an episode one tabloid described as Peter Capaldi's 12th Doctor ponders whether to murder a child. In The Witch's Familiar, the Doctor and Davros sit down and have a chat about morality, ageing and legacy. Two bitter enemies coming to an understanding. Except that it's all a ruse by the Dalek creator to steal the Doctor's regeneration energy. It's this that the Doctor siphons off to allow Davros to see one more Scaro sunrise. In a moment that isn't quite as moving as it should be, Davros opens his eyes. The eyes that have been obscured by scar tissue for the 40 years prior to this, meaning that he's had to rely on the glowing blue eye mounted in his forehead. Peering through the black makeup, Julian Bleach does his best to sell the emotion of the scene. A moment that was intended to humanise the Dalek's creator instead led to perplexed fans joking about Davros's peepers on social media. And yet, the answer is staring you right in the face. That small burst of the Doctor's regeneration energy restored Davros his eyes. Number 5. What was the Grand Serpent up to? Those fans who were confused by the Grand Serpent scheme in the closing two episodes of Doctor Who Flux clearly weren't paying attention to the news during the pandemic. When the Flux ravages the universe, he sought the perfect opportunity to dominate the Earth and reign over the shattered remnants of the universe. To do this, he had to meddle with units past in order to manoeuvre himself into a position where he could control the planet's defence systems. Then he sold the planet out to the highest bidder, the Sontarans. He's basically a dodgy intergalactic PPE provider. It seems that the Doctor Who fans were too busy being outraged by the alternative unit chronology and demotion of Lethbridge Stewart to actually pay attention to what the Serpent's aims were. Kate Stewart literally spells it out to the audience before she goes into hiding. In The Grand Serpent, Chris Chibnall is taking aim at the opportunistic chances who seek to profit from tragedy, even the end of the universe itself. It's his greatest bit of satire since Unit was defunded just as a rogue Dalek is let loose, which it turns out was all part of The Grand Serpent's plan. Number 4. When do the unit stories take place? The unit dating controversy is a running debate in the Doctor Who fandom. Were the unit stories of Troughton and Pertwee's eras taking place in the present day or in the future? If in the future, then how has the Brigadier resigned to teach maths in 1976 in Mordrin Undead? Unit's debut story, The Invasion, is set in about 1979. So how can a man retire from an organisation that won't exist for another three years? If that wasn't bad enough, Sarah Jane Smith states that she's from 1980 in Pyramids of Mars. So in what year do stories like Invasion of the Dinosaurs or Robot take place? It's a question that has flummoxed fans for decades with attempts to resolve it in all various novels, audios and even DVD special features. The real answer is probably the simplest. The Brigadier wasn't supposed to be in Mordrin Undead. William Russell, who was originally due to return as Ian Chesterton, dropped out. Writer Peter Grimwade hastily rewrote the serial by slotting Lethbridge Stewart in, adding some lines about Unit, Axon and Daleks, etc. But he forgot to adjust the dates accordingly. More simply, time is always being rewritten and re shaped in Doctor Who, so it's probably for the best that Chris Chibnall upturned the apple cart with the Grand Serpent's meddling with Unit's chronology in flux. Number 3. Who is the woman? The mysterious woman in white who appears to Wilf in the end of time 
inspired many different theories on her possible identity. Was she Romana? Susan? The dialogue makes no clear distinction on who exactly the woman is, which fed into the endless speculation. Russell T Davies has stated exactly who she is though in his marvellous book The Writer's Tale. It's the Doctor's mother, and this was obviously made clear to both David Tennant and Claire Bloom and comes across in their performances. By 2020 it was accepted that this was indeed the Doctor's mother. And then the timeless children came along. Presumably the woman is the adoptive mother of the Doctor after the Ruth Doctor had their memories wiped. Or is it Tek Taeyun? We saw in The Brain of Morbius that the Doctor does have repressed memories of their previous pre-Hartnell selves. Could that go for Tek Taeyun too? It's so confusing, right? Except it's not. Not really. The woman is the Doctor's mother. It doesn't matter that she's clearly not his birth mother. It doesn't even matter if she's a version of Tek Taeyun. She is the woman who raised him as he remembers and that is all that matters in that moment. Number 2. What is the hybrid? The supposed big bad of series 9 kept fans guessing and then predictably left them angry and confused. Because as with all ominous prophecies, the answer is never as satisfying as the one you concoct in your fan brain. The hybrid is not some terrible combination of Viking and Myr, or Dalek and Time Lord, or Zygon and Human. It's a metaphor, an allegory. That's what most prophecies are, they're stories, they're not to be taken literally. We learned all that from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? The hybrid is a metaphor for the Doctor and Clara's relationship. That's what it always was and the various red herrings scattered throughout the series feel half-hearted. It's a far more satisfying conclusion than if the hybrid had been revealed to be Maisie Williams's me. The hybrid is Time Lord and Human, more specifically the Doctor and his unwavering devotion and loyalty to Clara. Look at what he does to save her life. He returns to his home planet as a villain and a tyrant. Regeneration or not, he kills someone. The big bad of series 9 is the Doctor himself and it's a gripping, devastating performance by Peter Capaldi. Can you honestly say that a Dalek Time Lord hybrid would have been better? You've seen the Cyber Lords, right? Number 1. Who is the Curator? Whilst you may not have been able to hear the dialogue between the Curator and the 11th Doctor, over the joyous cheers and applause at the return of Tom Baker, there have been plenty of opportunities since the day of the Doctor aired to go back and listen. So the raft of who is the curator think pieces and tweet threads in the months after seemed like a willful ignorance of the written dialogue. I can only tell you what I would do if I were you. Oh, if I were you. Oh, perhaps I was you, of course. Or perhaps you are me. He's very plainly a future, retired version of the Doctor who's chosen the aged face of his fourth incarnation. It's an allusion to Douglas Adams' Sharda, and yet people were still in doubt. It's taken Stephen Moffat's novelization of Day of the Doctor and several big finished box sets to further assert the identity of this future incarnation. And yet did we really need all of this to explain a sweet, lovely, not at all ambiguous nod to the show's past and future to confused fans? Who knows, eh? Who knows? And that concludes our list. If there are some Doctor Who moments that confused you that weren't mentioned in this list then comment them below and while you're there like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. I've been Ellie with Who Culture and in the words of River Song herself, goodbye sweeties.